right, we're now ready to proceed on to our keynote panel session, which will follow up on the topics that Nancy Fulray addressed just now. We'll have a keynote panel session featuring Karen Ground, Yang Ok Kim, and Yasuki Sawada, moderated by Elizabeth King, non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, also the co-principal investigator of the Care Work and the Economy Project. Elizabeth, if you can please start off the session by giving a brief introduction of your session participants. I wasn't being unmuted, so. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to, these, uh, to the keynote panel session for this uh, first day of the Seoul Policy Dialogue. Um, and I have the great pleasure to introduce three experts in this, um, on this topic. Let me introduce first um, Karen Grown. Dr. K Dr. Grown is the senior director for gender at the World Bank uh, World Bank Group. She uh, is recognized internationally as an expert on gender and development. Before joining the World Bank, she was um, she had uh, academic positions and um, has, of course published uh, quite uh, a lot on this topic. Dr. Young Up Kim is an Emeritus Fellow of the Korean Women's Development Institute. She has uh, Dr. Groen and Dr. Kim, both have uh, PhDs in economics. Um, Dr. Kim has served a long time as a board member of the Korean Women Econ Economist Association. And she was also, um, uh, in 2003 to 2004, she joined the government on a full-time basis as a policy advisor to the Ministry of Gender Equality and has also been um, doing some visiting scholarships in US institutions. Dr. Uh, Yasu Sawada is chief economist at the uh, Asian Development Bank. And as such, he's the chief spokesperson for ADB on economic and development trends, and also leads the economic research and regional cooperation department at ADB, which publishes ADB's fla uh, flagship uh, knowledge products. Dr. Sawada is also a, I guess he's on leave from the University, uh, from the Tokyo University where he was a professor before his current appointment. So because we're running a little late, I'm just gonna go and open the floor immediately to, uh, first we'll start, Karen, let's start with you and then we'll go to Young Ok and then Yasu Sawada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to join this event and I would really like to thank our Korean hosts for their great support and also for the inspirational example. And I also have to say that I'm always inspired by Nancy she um, is a thinker who has uh, very much uh, not just influenced my own trajectory throughout my professional career, but I'm very happy that she is recognized as one of the uh, world's most intellectual thought, uh, inspirational intellectual thought leaders. So great to listen to Nancy. Um, and maybe I can just start by setting a bit of the pre-COVID uh, uh, and COVID context. And I was thinking about this talk uh, and to get myself thinking about it, I thought I would just re recall, bring to mind some of the demographic trends and transitions that's really relevant to this conversation for not just South Korea, but for some of the higher income countries in East Asia and the Pacific. Um, as I think everybody knows, pre-COVID, uh, the East Asian Pacific region as a whole really underwent a demographic transition that changed the region's age structure significantly uh, due both to fertility declines, the proportion of the working age population is really at its peak. And that is estimates, not just from the bank, but from UN and so forth. And I think that really has implications for the care workforce. And we really need uh, to think about that critically. Um, it's expected to decline while the share of older people also increases. I was, um, I knew it, but I was, uh, had to remind myself that the population 
in East Asia and Pacific is aging more rapidly than any region in history. And I thought actually it was Latin America, but I was wrong. And as I noted, the main driver is actually a rapid decline. And as Nancy alluded to, main driver is a rapid decline in fertility combined with steady increases, not just in life expectancy, but in healthy life expectancy. And I think that's also really important. Um, in the region, the share of the population that are ages 65 and older accounted for about 7% of the population in 2010, which was quite similar to Latin America and the Caribbean. But today, the average share of the total population in the 65 and older age group is about 14%. And it's projected to be at 36% by 2060. So I'm saying this to make the point that in the long term, the demands for care and the demands for elder care in particular are only likely to grow. And we know that uh, uh, the population aging has substantial implications for both women and men, but men and women actually follow somewhat different trajectories. Uh, the number of older people is projected uh, to grow from about 901 million in 2015 to 1.4 billion in 2030. Men, most of these will be women. So in addition to a silver population, we're going to have a female silver population. It's expected that uh, women will be more than 61% of the oldest of the old. And I have to say, not just are women a large share of the aging population, as we all know, women also are the providers of care to the elderly population. Time use surveys from around the world and in East Asia and the Pacific show that women provide the large majority of unpaid long-term care. And the same data that show that across countries of women who provide long-term care, but largely women of reproductive age, those women are less likely to be in paid employment they're, uh, less, they're more likely to work fewer hours among those who do paid work and to carry the double burden of paid work and unpaid care. In most regions around the world, COVID increased women's responsibilities for care. And it also sharply exposed the insufficient supply for care services by both the public and the private sectors. But I have to say, when I looked at the work from our household surveys, both by the UN uh, as well as by the World Bank, we're monitoring country uh, impacts of COVID every single month now. The picture in East Asia and the Pacific looks a little bit different than in other uh, regions. In other regions, women are absorbing the lion's share of caring with fewer increases of men into caring tasks. However, in East Asia and the Pacific, our household surveys show that men and boys are actually helping more at home since the spread of COVID. And more specifically, more than half of the women who were surveyed in our samples in Asia noted that uh, their partners helped at home, while 35 to 80%, of course, that's a huge range, depending on the country, noted that boys, sons, are helping more than before. So while women and girls are still providing more help at home or more of the care at home, it remains to be seen whether this trend, and I don't even know if I wanna call it a trend, this uh, increased participation of men and boys within the home will continue beyond the pandemic. I wanna to turn to a few things that I think are important on the policy front as we think about making care uh, an essential part of the COVID recovery conversation and thinking about how we encourage uh, the persp perspective of care, not as a cost, but care as an investment and care as an essential ingredient of the economic infrastructure. And I wanna say a few things about both child care and elder care. And as I said, COVID has laid bare the deep inadequacies in the current system of care around the world, including uneven access, poor quality, 
the need for public finance, poor terms of employment for the workforce, and the overall vulnerability of the sector. And I think that's a hugely important issue. We need smart investments to actually support both families and the development of a child care sector, a child care industry through a variety of channels um, that enables parents to return to work. And I wanna make the point that expanding the child care economy offers substantial employment opportunities. In a recent study, the World Bank itself estimated that the expansion of the child care workforce to meet current demands could create 43 million jobs globally. And these jobs are important to the future of work as they're much less vulnerable to automation than other employment opportunities. One of the most important aspects of quality in the sector is a capable, caring, and qualified workforce with career ladders, with appropriate training opportunities, and it's incredibly important investments for the multipliers that will come. Expanding child care could also create millions of small business opportunities, and that's also important for women and men entrepreneurs who could generate income at the same time as meeting the unmet demands and community needs for care. I agree with Nancy that expanding access to quality and affordable care will generate a number of positive externalities and should be therefore an area, a priority area for public intervention and public finance. Uh, without government support, care will not be accessible to the most vulnerable families, those who are very low income and struggling to survive. There are a range of policy options that are available to governments. But one of the things I think is essential that we sometimes forget is a whole of government approach is needed to leverage diverse solutions. It's not just the Ministry of Labor, it's not the Ministry of Health, it's not the Ministry of Education, or the Ministry of Finance. It's all ministries working together to develop financing mechanisms and a strong enabling environment, including the appropriate regulatory environment to expand access to affordable, quality, and accessible care. And there's lots that could be done through the tax system in terms of things like child uh, care related tax credits as well as, uh, as expenditures, including subsidies and allowances, both in kind and cash, which if done well, can promote quality care for children and elders. And I wanna say a few words on elder care before I conclude. Integrated systems are super important for care. And we know that in Asia, there is a preference for family-based care. But there is a need for many Asian economies to be thinking about decentralized systems, uh, decentralized networks that are seamless networks of families, communities, and social care services, along with part strong participation of the healthcare system for elder care. In many countries, community care and social care is undersupplied. And in order to achieve an integrated care service, there does have to be an alignment of goals across players in all systems, which demands this integrated multi-sector approach. Expanding home and community elder care workforce, again, like the child care workforce, is a job creator and also can provide multiplier effects in the economy. I wanna say one more word on this before I conclude. For both child and elder care, the private sector has a real incentive to be a full partner in efforts to enhance care. Governments have a very important role through the regulatory and public finance uh, framework, but the private sector equally has a very important role to play, including the right kind of workplace environment, their leave policies, and the financial support that they can provide to their communities and to uh, their workforces. As we think about the, uh, finally the demand for and supply of care services for all of those who need them, for all of those who provide them, we need to think much more carefully as well about gender and social norms 
that govern the distribution of care, especially that those norms that can help us to do the right kinds of redistributions, redistributions of care from women to men within families, the redistribution between families and communities, and also between the public and private sectors. This is a moment of opportunity to put in place systematic, coherent, and holistic approaches to enhance quality and address the myriad of constraints, including persistent gender and social norms that hold back making care a part of economic infrastructure. And I'd like to just conclude with the, um, the, the phrase that we've heard time and again, never waste a crisis, use the opportunity, let's build forward differently, let's not go back, let's build forward in ways that actually create the conditions for men and women to express that side of themselves as caring individuals and the kind of societies we want to create going forward. Thank you, Beth. Thank you very much, Karen. That's a terrific uh, and comprehensive response to the challenges that Nancy threw out during her amazing and inspirational speech. So um, Karen, you, you've uh, looked at the world, but also focus on East Asia, because I guess we are in Seoul. So now I, I'm going to turn to um, Dr. Sawada, yes, who uh, uh, tell us about what the Asian Development Bank is actually thinking about in terms of um, care policies. Hello, hello. Uh, I hope uh, I had some uh, technical <laughs> yeah, uh, glitch. Uh, I, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bess. Um, uh, and uh, good evening, good ap afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the organizers in Korea uh, for uh, having me at this uh, very exciting uh, uh, panel and conference. Uh, actually, I wanted to share the slide um, uh, for a few minutes. Uh, intervention. So uh, I think you are <laughs> seeing my uh, this desktop. So I'll show you this my slide. Uh, yes, I think Nancy's uh, very insightful presentation and also uh, Karen's uh, very, very uh, comprehensive and uh, succinct summary uh, set a very nice stage for this uh, panel. Uh, I have a few slides to make uh, comments from a uh, uh, broader picture. Uh, because um, uh, as um, uh, Beth asked me, uh, multilateral development bank, uh, uh, including ADB, can play a role in overall financing, as well as uh, creating and disseminating uh, relevant uh, uh, knowledge, uh, also sharing policy advice. So uh, uh, critical uh, uh, roles um, uh, ADBs and other MDBs can play. So, uh, so in order to set the broad picture, I'd like to uh, uh, start by uh, uh, very ambitiously uh, postulating one possible characterization of the care economy in a broad framework of economics uh, based on uh, uh, Nancy's uh, very, very uh, stimulating uh, uh, presentation. Um, this chart basically shows a trinity of market, state, and community mechanisms. Uh, the market, not to mention, uh, is a mechanism to coordinate uh, profit-oriented consumers and, uh, uh, I mean, utility maximizing uh, consumers and profit oriented the producers through uh, competition and uh, the uh, signal or parametric uh, price changes. And if um, um, uh, uh, economy is a frictionless uh, uh, market, then uh, market mechanisms can work very well uh, in allocation of private goods uh, efficiently. But the uh, market uh, failures are uh, uh, rampant due to externalities, public goods, and uh, incomplete uh, markets, in imperfect uh, uh, markets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so market often fails, uh, providing proper care, especially for dependents and uh, elders. So market failure, I'd like to start. And then uh, uh, government uh, uh, is supposed to correct market failure, at least partially, by using uh, um, uh, uh, the command of the uh, government. Uh, this is effective in allocating, especially global uh, or general public goods, but the government also fails um, uh, uh, everywhere uh, due to uh, distorted incentives of uh, politicians and uh, uh, bureaucracy. Um, so under market failure and the government failure, uh, I think a community plays a, a key role. So this is a discussion based on uh, uh, usual Hayami and the Boris Gintis um, uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, um, so um, to collect the market failures uh, and the government failures, community 
which is built on basically social capital, uh, 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 complementing market transactions and government public goods for, uh, provisions. Uh, community is a mechanism uh, that guides the community members to voluntarily cooperate uh, based on the uh, incentives, uh, uh, intensive social interactions through community specific social capital. Community has advantage in allocating, especially local public goods. Uh, indeed, social capital often measured by a public goods gain in experimental economics and behavioral economics. So uh, within this framework, I, I, I would consider the care economy is driven mostly by community social capital if we uh, uh, augment uh, uh, social capital concept to family and extended fa family networks as part of uh, social capital. Uh, indeed, Nancy also mentioned distinctive feature of care provision, uh, such as uh, being motivated by artists. I think artism is the one uh, uh, really uh, uh, core component of uh, uh, maintaining uh, uh, good social capital. Uh, uh, with this logic, the uh, care economy can be regarded as an entity which can produce and supply local as well as a household level public goods in amending uh, 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 market and uh, government failure. So this is the uh, sort of a conceptual framework I want to ambitiously illustrate. And then uh, from Asia, uh, one slide I'd like to share with you. Um, we published 530 pages a book titled Asia's Journey to Prosperity uh, January last year. Uh, this is basically a kind of an encyclopedia on Asian development in the last five decades, uh, with uh, 15 chapters, including uh, one chapter uh, designated to uh, gender. Uh, using a chart from this book, uh, uh, gender chapter, it's clear women have been playing a critical role in Asia's uh, care economy. Uh, women across the region um, spend at least a twi uh, two times more than the men on unpaid care work. It is estimated women in the region work the longest hours in the world when they pay and the unpaid work is combined according to IDO study. So these are the figures before uh, COVID-19, but presumably uh, as a current also uh, briefly touch upon, pandemic has exacerbated the care economy burden on women. Uh, closures of schools and child centers resulted in a large increase in demand on the time of parents in general, and also uh, time of mothers in particular. Um, and then um, um, again, uh, a little bit the broader uh, 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 you know, view, uh, picture of the COVID uh, recovery. Uh, as for the economic recovery uh, of the region as a whole, uh, after the mild contraction last year, actually uh, Asia uh, economy rebounded in growth uh, but still uh, leave uh, GDP level below its pre-pandemic uh, trend. So um, uh, it, uh, recovery will be incomplete in uh, next, uh, um, sorry, this one. So top left uh, shows the GDP trajectory. So basically um, a pandemic leave uh, uh, recovery uh, incomplete over the next um, uh, couple of years. Um, but having said this, countries like China uh, will achieve almost complete recovery within uh, uh, two years horizon. So recovery process in Asia have been uh, quite diverse. And pandemic accelerated transition to digital economy, heightened uh, contribution of digital services in enabling economic activities such as uh, e-health, online education, telework, and also online uh, meeting like uh, uh, us today, uh, uh, despite the containment measures. Uh, but also uh, concern is a digital divide in Syria uh, in um, uh, 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 post-pandemic uh, recovery. And um, a digital divide is also uh, I closely related to um, uh, effectively uh, uh, maintain a care economy. Uh, government has taken uh, steps to mitigate uh, economic impacts, but this has been also putting a uh, uh, strain on government uh, fiscal positions by uh, um, uh, you know, enhancing uh, debt to public debt to GDP ratio substantially. Uh, with these fears in mind, I think a COVID-19 really hi highlights the importance of getting back wellness of the people and also maintaining and also strongly supporting the care economy. So now uh, uh, last um, uh, couple of slides I'd like to touch upon uh, first uh, uh, wellness. So what is wellness? Wellness is the active pursuit of activity choices and lifestyles that leads the state of a holistic health. And uh, last year we released this um, uh, Asian Development Outlook update, a same chapter on wellness. And actually wellness is a center to development. Um, uh, UN uh, SDG uh, uh, goal number three 
uh, actually stated uh, 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 issues around the awareness. Uh, but COVID-19 has heightened the importance of awareness because a uh, crisis has uh, battered uh, physical and mental health of the uh, Asian people. I'd like to point out uh, awareness economy could be an engine to support regions recovery from the uh, uh, current uh, uh, crisis. Awareness is a large and growing part of regional economy indeed. According to um, uh, 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 pre-COVID-19 uh, data, 11% of regional GDP can be um, uh, explained by uh, awareness uh, uh, sector. So um, policymakers, I think, can maintain the uh, care economy in order to promote awareness in post-pandemic uh, recovery. Um, sorry, I forgot to... So this is awareness uh, uh, slide. And then um, actually, uh, but in order to maintain uh, awareness and also achieving a sound uh, care economy, I think um, uh, careful um, uh, you know, financial support is uh, uh, needed. Um, so I'd like to uh, briefly touch upon uh, final slides, uh, uh, financing side of uh, uh, care economy. Uh, this is also related to uh, what Nancy called uh, necessary and productive step spending. And also um, uh, Karen also ma uh, made a, a claim that uh, 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 investment in care economy is really indispensable. So given the care economy does not exist in its isolation, uh, let me expand the uh, scope of a discussion to broaden uh, perspective of uh, uh, building back uh, better or, or building back uh, uh, greener or more inclusive and also well uh, digitalized uh, economy. Uh, building back better, uh, building back greener and more inclusive uh, requires uh, actually a large amount of uh, uh, capital. Um, and uh, ADB can definitely support uh, this uh, uh, financing. As the chart shows, Asia Pacific region needs to invest 1.5 trillion US dollars or uh, about 4% of GDP annually in order to achieve a uh, SDG goal by year 2030. Uh, this uh, funding requirement uh, includes, as you can see from the slide, um, uh, uh, investment in the renewable energies, both climate and environmental actions, uh, other infrastructure investment, social protection, as well as uh, health and education, which are related, closely related to, directly and closely related to care economy, and also support for digital transformation, bridging the uh, uh, digital divide. Um, two things I'd like to uh, highlight. Uh, first, this number includes a necessary direct investment to support the care economy, as I uh, mentioned, such as uh, finance and policy support to uh, universal health coverage, for example and also complementary uh, necessary investment in other uh, uh, sectors and uh, se other uh, issues. Uh, for example, providing a basic infrastructure remain essential for the care economy and gender uh, equality, uh, broadly speaking. Electricity, transport, uh, safe drinking water and sanitation all help mitigate women's time poverty, providing a greater opportunity for education and paid jobs for women. Um, and second thing I'd like to mention is that this is a figure as of 2019. So we can take this 1.5 trillion uh, US dollars annual necessary investment as a kind of a lower, lower bound uh, needs uh, to achieve a, a broader uh, 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 resilient care economy and also uh, broadly speaking, uh, building back greener and uh, more inclusive. Um, considering that this a large amount of necessary fun fun uh, funding uh, needs, uh, building back green and more inclusive requires uh, not only public resources, but also private finances. Uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize that uh, re very recently we observed surge in the social bond issuance in Asia, especially last year, 2020. Actually, if we take a global data, uh, setting aside the international organizations uh, or uh, multilateral development banks, uh, uh, inclusive bond issuance, Actually, Asia is the second largest uh, market right now uh, next to the Europe. So I think um, uh, you know, gender bonds and um, uh, 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 education bonds, et cetera, et cetera, is really uh, expanding sharply. So I think that not only private uh, uh, public financing, including MDBs, but also private uh, funding uh, is uh, really important. So this is the uh, summary of my, um, uh, how to say my initial intervention. Uh, so four points I'd like to uh, 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 postulate. Number one is a care economy can be considered as a basically public goods, especially local public goods or household level public goods. 
and which uh, can amend, have been and will amend market failures, government failure, um, possibly built on social capital, community level and extended family uh, uh, level uh, social capital. Secondly, um, as we briefly uh, saw, women have been playing a critical role in Asia's uh, care economy. Uh, uh, and also, uh, uh, thirdly, COVID-19 highlights the importance of wellness, achieving wellness, so that uh, making a, a, a care economy more uh, sustainable and more resilient. Um, having said this, building back better, uh, uh, broadly speaking, uh, not only care economy, supporting care economy, but um, associated complementary uh, uh, issues and areas, building back greener, building back more inclusive, both private and public uh, resources must be mobilized. And uh, we see some uh, uh, big uh, uh, structural uh, transformation in um, uh, public uh, private financing of uh, uh, social uh, necessary and uh, unproductive but uh, necessary social uh, uh, investment. So with that, I'd like to stop and I, I'm very happy to discuss uh, these issues uh, in this panel. Thank you, thank you very much. Over to you, uh, Beth, thank you. Thank you very much, Asu. Uh, and you've certainly given us a lot of things to, to think about and, and also to ask for more elaboration if we, had the t if, we had, if we have time. But now let's, so we've gone to now Asia and then let's zero in on Korea with Young Ak's presentation. Okay, thank you. I'm very privileged to participate in a keynote uh, panel session. First of all, I uh, thank you very much, Nancy, for your inspiring keynote speech and like to extend my thanks to Karen and uh, Yasu Sawada for the, uh, the, the nice presentation. Uh, Beth, could you, uh, could you open my uh, slides, please? I prepared uh, uh, six slides, so it won't be long. <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, second uh, slide, second page. Uh, following the uh, keynote speech, I'd like to extend my, our discussion to the characteristics of public goods. Uh, since care is a public good, government takes a role in its provision, so we call it a social provision. We can find quite some countries, uh, including Korea, where child care and elderly care are universalized. In these countries, care services have been developed from a privilege for few to a public good for all. As Paul Samuelson said, public goods are non-exclusive and accompanying uh, free rise, uh, the public goods are undersupplied. Here we see the government role in supplying care services. Uh, next question is, uh, is care uh, infrastructure? Uh, we agree that caring for children and the sick and the elderly is just as crucial to a functioning economy as any road, electric grid, or a building. Child care is essential for women and men uh, to be able to work. Uh, is the definition of infrastructure is that which enables the commerce and the economy activity. Uh, what could be more uh, fundamental than care? Uh, this is what Mrs. Pu said. Uh, she might be the first to, to use the term infrastructure to refer to care-related work in her 2015 book. Uh, named the age of dignity about caring for the elderly. Therefore, we need to place care at the top of national economic policy priorities and to make care expenditure a priority in economic recovery efforts from uh, the pandemic we face now and also the climate crisis and any uh, disaster. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, after agreeing uh, that the care is a public good, 
next question is uh, which services will be delivered, supplied to, and in what conditions? And who will be the supplies, uh, suppliers, or what delivery system uh, should be established? These are care policies. Uh, care policy is defined uh, as a process to respond to the uh, lack of care to recognize the value and to redistribute the roles of care from women to men and from uh, family to uh, society. Care policies cover uh, various uh, sectors, uh, uh, starting uh, from uh, children allowance and family allowance and cash uh, payments in kind and the care services for children and elders, and family-friendly work measures such as parental leaves and family leaves and flexible working arrangement. And even it includes uh, a provision of care-related infrastructure such as water, such as energy and hygiene and uh, uh, effic energy-efficient appliances. Uh, okay. Uh, nobody expect the pandemic uh, last uh, February. I think nobody expect uh, this pandemic uh, continued uh, ha or would continue so long. But the uh, COVID-19 is prevalence uh, over a year. Uh, COVID-19 outbreak uh, provided an uh, opportunity in a way to rethink uh, about the current status of care in our society. Uh, even before uh, the pandemic, state funding needs to increase in line with the rising costs and needs. Uh, Himoweit asserts that uh, rising costs of care service provision are inevitable. Total costs will not be affected unless lower quality or less care is provided or care workers are less paid. However, the public do not value low quality care. A great reliance on family is also unsustainable and lower pays will result in severe shortage of supply and care work sector, which already has a recruitment and retention issues. The pandemic made these uh, existing uh, care deficit, deficit worse and exacerbate inequality. With the pandemic's uh, dispar disparate impact on women with risk, uh, I worried losing decades of progress made by women in the workforce. Uh, according to United States recent work, schools and daycare closures due to the COVID-19 increased caregiving responsibilities for working parents, especially working mothers. Mothers have reduced their work hours far more than fathers. And also according to recent study in Korea, women with children after the COVID-19 were unemployed and out of the workforce far more than men. I'd like to conclude um, uh, my remarks by suggesting implications for Korea. First implication is Korea need to increase care expenditure. Uh, here we define uh, operationally care expenditure as the sum of uh, selected care policies uh, as a percentage of GDP. Uh, care expenditure takes, uh, uh, as you see in the uh, figure, uh, takes 8% of GDP in Denmark and Sweden. Uh, while the countries like South Africa, Mexico, Turkey, and India, and Indonesia spend less than 1% of GDP for care provision. Care expenditure in Korea is about 2% of GDP. So Korea ranked as uh, uh, 33rd among uh, 41 countries in uh, countries. So uh, we can say that uh, uh, comparatively expenditure, care expenditure in Korea is not enough. 
uh, another implication, my uh, yes, another implication is that Korea needs to construct high road to quality care or decent care. Uh, Oh, first of all, child care in Korea is free for all children. Uh, yeah. Among the uh, uh, two years old babies, uh, more than half of them, and almost all of uh, th uh, three to nine years old uh, children are enrolled in facility-based care in Korea. Uh, this is above the uh, OECD average, respectively 35% uh, and 87%. On, but only 17% uh, of children are enrolled in public care facilities, uh, which have a relatively uh, higher quality. So we see, uh, so we see the kind of, you know, the uh, uh, quality care delivery system. The number of child care teachers is uh, increased five times uh, from, uh, uh, from 47,000 to 240,000. Uh, but child care works are known for job instability and low pay and long hours of work. How about the elder care? Elder care in Korea is also universalized. The long, national long-term care insurance came into effect in uh, 2008. So already 11, uh, 12 years ago, uh, elder, elder care is, uh, was universalized. The recipient of elder care increased uh, to fast to uh, 772,000. In 2019, questions about the quality of the uh, LTC service have grown, have been raised uh, as the majority of the facilities are privately owned. Only 1% of the total LTC facilities are public. Uh, there are uh, 444,000 elder care workers in uh, 2019. They mostly face employment instability and low pays. Uh, Korea has been constructing uh, a road of universal care. I think it is a big step and achievement, but uh, should go on and go further from the place where we stand. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you, Young Ok. So I'm I'm presuming that we have a few minutes for uh, follow up discussion because that would be really good. Um, we we saw here that we have uh, certainly agreement with Nancy about the importance of care in uh, society and in the economy, and 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 also and, and that it's a because it's a public good. We should be countries should be spending on this public good, and it should not be. It is a very important input, in fact, into economic growth. I think that was what uh, Yasu Sawada was saying from from their work. Um, Young Ok actually brought up something very interesting, which is uh, I think we deserve some um, some discussion which is the importance not only of the provision of services, but also the quality of those services. That families care about the quality of the care services available. Um, there was a mention earlier that, that I think you were the one too who said something about the public services might actually be, you know, uh, we, you know the, the use of public and private will depend not just on, on the affordability, but also the, um, the, the quality of those services to, to families. Um, and to your point, Karen, that in fact, fert fertility, care and growth are all related. 
And that's something very important, certainly in Korea, which has been experiencing very steep decline in fertility. And there is interest in clawing back some of the uh, some, some for higher fertility, but it can't do that without really thinking about the care burden on families, in particular on mothers. So a very rich story. I would like to, to, to follow that up with um, perhaps Yasu and Karen, but are countries prepared for some of this trade-off? It seems to me that if trade-off between care and growth. It seems to me that to invest in care, there will there's a trade-off here because that's a different kind of infrastructure and because it, the, the focus might will, will not be just on, on, on GDP per capita, but also on, on care. Now you are saying that actually you can, we don't have to lose, uh, economic growth because one can actually build back greener and also the social inclusion. Now, I'm not, I don't know if, and, and also to, to include Nancy in this discussion, I don't know that I'm convinced that this is actually not costly in terms of economic growth. Anybody? Karen, Nancy, yes. Either one of you. Well, it, it, this depends on how you define growth. And to define growth, you have to define what your output is. And uh, I guess a big part of my argument is that we need to stop thinking about GDP as our metric. Um, I think you're right. If you're looking at the value of, of, of market uh, purchases and sales, there is a trade-off. Uh, that you know, that's why we need to be thinking, of, you know, more broadly about a kind of dashboard of indicators of of economic output rather than just GDP. I would agree with what Nancy has just said, and I would add a, a few more points. I think uh, we need to shift our mindsets, of course, uh, uh, away from a cost to an investment, and I think it's temporal. I think the short-term investment yields long-term returns and dividends. And I think uh, the, you know, it, the, that's the first thing. And in the uh, short term, I also think that countries um, have needful and wasteful spending. And there's plenty of room in fiscal budgets for reallocation of expenditures towards what uh, this kind of productive um, investment. And we've had a lot of uh, long discussions over many decades about quote unquote unproductive um, investment. And there is, um, I believe very firmly though, looking at fiscal policy and fiscal framework scope to reopen uh, those conversations. Uh, so uh, the temporal as the change in orientation the temporal aspect, the reallocation of existing expenditure. And I think if we also thought about domestic uh, revenue uh, mobilization uh, in different ways, I'm very heartened by uh, discussions, I think right now that seem to be more open about things like corporate income taxation and finding a, uh, a, an integrated framework for that. And I'm also heartened by a discussion of uh, carbon taxes uh, and environmental taxes that I think would be very critical for raising uh, public revenue that could be channeled to the right kind of investment. And and, and Yesu was and I, actually yeah. talking a little bit about social bonds as well. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I think I, I'd like to briefly touch on two things, um, uh, somewhat related to Karen's point. Uh, first, uh, I think that this seeming trade-off between care and growth uh, I think there, there is a room uh, to wisely avoid this uh, trade-off. Uh, uh, you know, Korea and also Japan, my home country, Japan, a front runner of uh, super aging. And um, uh, these uh, countries and economies always talks about people talking about uh, uh, so-called silver dividend. I'm not sure this is a politically correct word, but uh, silver dividend means uh, super aging, but uh, uh, keeping elders uh, healthy and also productive. 
that can, uh, by doing so, we can achieve a uh, uh, higher growth. So this is really uh, the way to wisely, uh, uh, you know, mitigate uh, a sharp uh, trade-off between uh, uh, care economy and uh, economic growth. And also uh, gender dividend, another uh, keyword we are uh, talking about in uh, East Asia. Uh, that's also, um, uh, you know, gender uh, equality and also growth can uh, go in tandem. So I think uh, there is a way to wisely avoid this. And also in private uh, sector, as uh, best um, briefly mentioned, I, I, I think uh, there is some uh, structural change is happening, especially in green bond. Now we see um, uh, those companies issuing uh, green bond can gain uh, better uh, uh, stock market returns. And also uh, in uh, Asian Development Outlook, we released uh, a month ago, we have a few uh, empirical results showing that uh, um, uh, you know, markets are now uh, really um, uh, guided by uh, uh, ESG object environment and uh, social and governance, and also uh, patient investors' uh, role uh, have been uh, expanded uh, a lot. So now firm side also became uh, so much sensitive uh, to uh, you know respond to these uh, market needs and the market uh, uh, environment. So I think um, 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 now uh, we see this is already happening in green uh, um, uh, green financing, and now social financing there is a sign. Of happening the same. So I think uh, 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 trade off of care and uh, growth, I think that this has been uh, uh, fundamentally changing, uh, not only in a, a public uh, way of thinking as well as the private market. So I think uh, I'd like to mention these things. And uh, uh, domestic resource mobilization also uh, important, uh, you know, if um, uh, especially for Korea and Asia, if uh, uh, COVID recovery has been uh, completed, uh, many investments. Uh, investors from outside will flowing into Asia. So why not tax uh, this uh, you know, investment so that the benefit and profit of recovery can be uh, recycled into uh, supporting care economy. So I think uh, ERM is a really important agenda. And actually ADB has been uh, 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 started the uh, 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 regional tax hub uh, just the last, the last month. And uh, so that uh, not only domestic resource mobilization, but also international tax collaboration and cooperation, um, uh, expanding uh, resources to support the uh, care economy and uh, social uh, 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 sector. So yes, these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for um, clarification. Um, yes, I want to go back to a slide that Young Ok showed, which showed that many, there's, uh, many families are actually using child care provision for especially for three to five years old but it's, it's almost like it's 95 percent but she was also saying that most would really prefer public facilities rather than the private facilities that they use doesn't that to me it indicates that there's a role of government that's not being used in order to um, in order to regulate quality why isn't the government doing that and increasing the trust of families in the private providers? Because in a way, that's sort of what Yasu was saying too, is that in, you know, if, if you want to use more of the private providers and you want to grow the economy of care, you, you, would, you would also need to, uh, to, to rely on more private provision. Uh, yeah, mm, the problem is that the uh, Korean <laughs> people and also the Korean policy is uh, uh, very uh, hot temper. And, uh, we we uh, we'd like to solve the problem rather relatively in short uh, time. Uh, since the government decided uh, the. Uh, child care and uh, elderly care uh, should be universalized. Uh, then they like to uh, uh, universalize the care very uh, shortly. Then who uh, institution, who facility, uh, which facilities can you know afford the, all the, uh, the the service delivery, uh, service provision. The so government can, uh, during the short time, government couldn't establish the build the new 
uh, kindergartens or the LTC institutions. So, so there are, they uh, provided the uh, fund, the individuals and uh, 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 private uh, owners uh, to build and operate the facilities. Yeah. So the, uh, the, through that mechanism, uh, during the short period, we can, you know, the uh, pro provided the, uh, the, uh, the these services. Yeah? Uh, so, but uh, uh, control the care uh, quality is another problem. There are a lot of, you know, the uh, uh, adverse selection and as you uh, as you name all kinds of you know the cheatings and exploitations, so that is the uh, way of the government uh, uh, provide the uh, care services and uh, universalize the care. So uh, this kind of uh, uh, result we face. So I'd like to say. Uh, to build a high road uh, to the universal care, we should think, uh, uh, you know, the uh, minimum time period. Uh, we, uh, we should uh, construct the road very uh, sound and solid, not the, uh, so it, then, we need a kind of, you know, uh, sort of, you know, time. But uh, in Korea, uh, in a way, uh, in a relatively short period, we achieved the universalization. But uh, in looking in deeper, uh, these problems we face. And also, I'd like to, since I got the uh, mic, <laughs> I'd like to uh, uh, say a short comments on the, uh, you, uh, Beth, you brought the uh, care, uh, trade of care and uh, economic growth. Hmm? Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, just, just uh, I've been told that we don't have much time. So okay. uh, if you can make it short, uh, young Ok. Mm -hmm. Yes, very quickly. And more and more uh, people uh, now say that the economic growth driven model uh, is not sustainable. I think uh, more and more people uh, agree that. Uh, so the trade, uh, so the uh, considering uh, this, uh, you know, intellectual trend, uh, I think the people now uh, uh, try to think about the relations between care and uh, quality, uh, uh, quality of life or well-being rather than economic growth. So it um, doesn't too much matter, I think. And I particularly like your, your phrase, the high road. Mm. Of care policy. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. I want to reserve my last question for Nancy, just uh, because she, we didn't get a chance to actually uh, ask her too many questions. Nancy, the, some people might be thinking, you know, on the one hand, you say, let's value care. Let's, the, the work that women do is very important. It should be part, really, we should think about socioeconomic development, which has care as part of that. Um, and, you know, the point that J Yasu also was saying about wellness, right? That is, is really part of development. Now, at the same time, we are saying also that women should be going out to the labor market, or at least allow women to go out to the labor market and not shoulder the huge burden of care. In Pakistan, what was it? 17 times the amount of time that men spend in unpaid care and domestic uh, production is being, uh, is being done by women. So huge burden on women. Do people have people, you know, people might ask you on the one hand, you say, well, let's value that time that women are putting in care. On the other hand, let's reduce that time and um, allow women to go into the labor market. 
Well, it's like, uh, it's like any other economic analysis. You want to improve the productivity uh, of care work. Um, and the way to do that is by finding a better balance between family provision, social provision, community provision. I think the, the, you know the kind of integrated system that that we're talking about. But I'm really glad you raised you posed the question the way you did because I think we also really need to consider the length of the work week and the fact that it will be basically impossible to find a better balance between paid work and family work unless uh, we make part-time and flexible work uh, an, you know, an inherent part of paid employment. And um, I think that's a particular challenge in Korea, but um, everywhere globally, I think we should be reconsidering um, the, uh, the ways in which paid work is temporally structured. It's, not, it's just not functional. And by the way, COVID gave us some really insights there as well with the new opportunities for telecommuting and, and working from, from home that I think could be expanded um, in a lot of ways. So I think we, we should be really, we should really look for some, some new solutions in that, in that direction as well. Thank you very much, Nancy. So one of the key lessons I think from thinking about the economy and who has been doing work, uh, care work seems that many countries have been able to grow fast and intensively, intensely, especially in East Asia, partly on the back of women who were doing most of the work at home. And, yeah. and, and that it has to change if wellness is going to be part of our uh, indicators of economic development and social, social development. Mm -hmm. It cannot, it, we cannot continue the way it is because it's just not, it's not fair. So if um, I would like to end our, our uh, panel discussion on that, thank you so much. Karen Groan, Young Ok Kim, Yasu Sawada, and of course, Nancy Fulbright. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beth. I would also like to extend my thanks to all of our panel experts and of course our moderator to help us really reflect on how we recovered or how we're trying to recover from COVID-19 by looking into the re-emerged importance of care and, and gender equality.